So inshallah, we're going to talk about this conversation. We'll have a conversation on the topic of loneliness and give some practical tips and advice. As you know, I tend to speak a lot on mental health, but from an Islamic perspective. So inshallah, that's what we're going to do together today. So first, what comes to your mind when I say mental health and Islam? You can speak it out, out loud. Depression, aqida, I think that's what I heard. Peace, what else? Surat al-Kahf, is that what you said? Surat al-Duha, nice, mashallah. What else? Tama'anina, right, feeling a sense of kind of, kind of contentment, security. Hmm. Husna dhan billah, having a good opinion of Allah. Nice. What else? Peace. Peace again. What is it? A sense of balance. Okay, mashallah. So notice this. Everybody had a, almost everybody had a different definition or a different term that came to mind when we said mental health in Islam. And also, we heard one clinical term, which is depression, but all the others actually had more spiritual religious connotations that they actually talked about instead. So that's very interesting, and that's going to tie into our conversation just now. We'll define mental health from where it is in the textbooks, although I would say that there is some room to think about this definition, but let's look at some of the basic things that they say. A state of well-being where an individual realizes his or her own abilities, can cope with normal stressors of life, and is able to make a contribution to his or her community. So you see three main things here. An understanding of your abilities, knowing who you are, knowing what your limitations are, which includes knowing when to reach out for help and when you've reached your limit. Many times, and the majority of the room are women, and I welcome the men in the room, may Allah bless you all, but all of us, particularly women, we tend to keep pushing and pushing and pushing even when, subhanAllah, we've reached that limit. In fact, we've crossed the limit. In fact, we've given too much from what we need to be giving, and it's actually becoming detrimental or harmful to us. But we're conditioned, either by culture or by family or by our own internal states, to just keep on giving, even when our cup is empty. And we don't often pause quite enough to refuel to refill that cup. You're filling your cup tonight, inshallah. That's actually what you're doing here, alhamdulillah. It's taking a moment for yourself, for growth, for really connecting spiritually, I hope, inshallah. Many of you have just come from the prayer, alhamdulillah. Beautiful space, beautiful masjid, mashallah. All of that is refilling your cup. There's also the sense of being able to cope with stressors of life. And before I go any further, I need to acknowledge now, for the last several months, we have been witnessing horrific, horrific. We have been witnesses to horrific atrocities to our sisters and brothers in Gaza and in Palestine in general. And in the Ummah, but particularly at the moment, Gaza. And as you go through your social media feeds or wherever else that you're getting your news from, it has been really intense. So how do you cope with what humans were not meant to cope with. Even us, far away from what's happening in Gaza. Safety, security, a sense of, you know, you have electricity, you have food, you have water, you have safety. But yet there's something very real about vicarious trauma that comes through that phone and it's right in the palm of your hand every single day you wake up and you look at it. Middle of the day you look at it. Before you go to sleep you look at it. We humans were not created for that. And so yes, we've been dealing with a lot of stress. I don't know that anyone's mental health in this room is necessarily on par. But we need to be able to keep on working towards that, and especially raising our hands in du'a for our sisters and brothers. Allahumma faraj lahum ya rab, ameen. The third part of this is a contribution to society, to your community. And some of you have this. You figured out what it is that you want your legacy to be. What you want, your sadaqa jariya, your ongoing charity once you leave this earth behind, what that's going to be that's in your name. 
And we hope that there are people who remember you after you've long passed. I have to tell you something very quickly. In this room, for the last two days, we've been having a conference. That's actually why I'm here in Qatar. And it's an, it was a symposium, a symposium on Islamic psychology. And it was really amazing because all the great writers and authors of Islamic psychology were actually in the room. SubhanAllah, it was really amazing. Some people who I've alhamdulillah have met before, but others who I've never seen before, but I've cited their papers so many times, and then you see them in person, and you're like, oh, you're so-and-so, mashallah. <laughs> it's really wonderful. But what really struck me is, in, there wasn't a single panel of the conference that we had, that there wasn't somebody who mentioned the name of one of my dear mentors who passed away, Professor Malik Badri, rahimahullah, for those who are familiar with the, you know, kind of the, the grandfather or the forefather of modern Islamic psychology. And it was amazing to me that his name get kind of mentioned over and over and over again through the whole conference. And yet he's not here with us. And I think to myself, that is a sadaqa jariya. That is a ilmun yantafa bihi. That is knowledge that he's left behind in his grave for years now, in which people are still benefiting from. That he's left waladun salihun yad'u lahu. He's left righteous, in this case, not biological, he has biological children too, but in this case, kind of a spiritual children, mentees, who continue to make dua for him. We have read the Fatiha for him so many times in this weekend. It really struck me, subhanAllah, because he was also a very dear mentor to me. And I think about what does that mean to leave a legacy? What does it mean that you leave something behind, that there's a footprint on this earth that you leave behind? And so for anyone who feels like, I don't know what that is, inshallah, make your intention and dua tonight, right now, oh Allah, help me figure that out. Oh Allah, help me be a person who's going to leave a legacy and a footprint behind, in any which way, subhanAllah. And so that is part and parcel of mental health because when you don't know what that's going to be, it messes with you a bit. What am I doing here? You have these existential crises about what's the point of this world? What's the point of life? What's the point of all the trauma that we're seeing? But when you have these aspects, mental health starts to improve. Now, let's keep going here. I'd like to begin our conversations talking about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because he is the ultimate example of the perfected human being. A human being, but perfect. As in to say, perfection embodied as close as you can get to perfection is the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And if you want to know good mental health, if you want to know wellness, if you want to know what it is to treat the antidote to anything, today we're gonna to talk about loneliness, you first look at the life of the Prophet Your answers will be there first. And then perhaps amongst the Sahaba, and then after that, the companions of the righteous generations that come after. And so many greats that are great people, great thinkers and scholars and people who inspire us over time. But first we start with the Prophet When people have a hard time with this conversation on mental health, I often remind them, you don't have to go too far in our tradition in order to see mental health clearly in front of you. This dua here is part of the athqar that you say typically on a daily basis. Where do you normally see this dua? What is it? Good, athqar is sabahi wal masa. It's part of the dhikr that you say in the morning and the evening. So pay attention to this with me. It says, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to say, part of his dua, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al-hammi wal-hazan wal-ajzi wal-kasal wal-jubni wal-bukhl wal-dal'i al-dayni wal-ghalabat al-rijal. O oh Allah, I seek refuge in you from worry and grief, from incapacity and laziness, from cowardice and miserliness, from being heavily in debt and from being overpowered by others. the first few words of that dua. Do you see the first few words? Allahumma inni a'udhu bika. Right, I seek refuge in you the way we seek refuge from shaitan. I seek refuge in you from what? Alham, wal hazan. Worry and grief. In some translations they translate it as anxiety and depression. 
whatever it is, they're speaking to something that's directly mental health related. And here is the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who I just told you is perfection embodied. Why does he get up on every day and make a dua that Allah protect him from worry and grief? Because they're human emotions. And he is human, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Because he is a living example that teaches all the rest of us how to live life, how to do this thing called life. And that they're going to be amongst his companions and the people, all of us, the many generations thereafter of Muslims and people, humans, who are going to experience worry and grief. And by example, he is teaching, this is what you do. You ask Allah for protection from that. But you don't deny it. You don't hide it under the rug. You don't make believe that it's not there. And you don't shame people and stigmatize people and aib alik and bad on you and shame on you and you don't have enough iman and you're not praying enough and go read more Quran. That's not the answer. Because it's not the prophetic example. The prophetic example is you face it. You ask Allah for assistance and then you go do something about it. As we're going to see here shortly. I have a really hard time with these concepts. They're very prevalent in the Muslim world, but they're also prevalent in the Western world in which I live, where people will say to one another, I'll say it in Arabic first, المؤمن لا يصاب بالاكتئاب. A believer is not afflicted with depression. And this couldn't be further from the truth. Why? Because you have an entire year in the Prophet's Sira, that the historians of his life, people who have written the Sira, have termed or coined what? What? The year of sorrow, the year of sadness, the year of grief. What do you call this in Arabic? Am al Huzun. I didn't say Yom al Huzun. I didn't say Shahr al Huzun. I said Am al Huzun. Do you know what I mean? What night did we just pass? the night of the 27th of Rajab, which many of the scholars of Sira also say was the night of the Isra and Mi'raj, the night journey and ascension. And it's powerful, especially in these days of what's happening in Palestine, subhanAllah. But also to understand that that journey came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I'll touch on this for a moment since it's very time sensitive and relative right now, that it comes to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam after an entire year of grief. This was his antidote. After the death of who? Who knows the series of the Sira? Series of events that happen in this year. Who dies first? No. Who dies first? Oh, wow. Oh, we need a Sira halaqa. What's going on? His uncle. Excellent. His uncle, Abu Talib. Who dies next? Khadija radiallahu anha. Think about, in brief, I'll just say this, instead of going to a whole Sira discussion because we have much to cover, think about his uncle, who most historians say was not Muslim, is somebody who was a protector to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. What today you might call an ally, someone who's not from your faith, but someone who protects you. And as long as he was alive, Quraysh couldn't touch the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So when he died, now, there is a big bounty on the head of the Prophet ﷺ. If you kill this man, you'll have a hundred camels. Essentially, you're going to become a billionaire at that time. So now it's dangerous. And then soon after, his wife Sayyidah Khadija radiallahu anha also dies. And this is his internal protection. The one who comforts him and holds him. Cover me, hold me. And she reminds him, Allah's never going to want bad for you. You're a good man. Takes him to Waraqa, helps him understand what just happened. Right? So she passes away. What happens after that? Who knows next? Ta'if. He says, fine, Quraysh is not going to ever accept this message. I'm going to go to the next city over. Walks 50 miles over to Ta'if only for them to humiliate him and hurt him and throw him with rocks and do all kinds of terrible things. And in the backdrop, you have an economic boycott. Think about this for a minute. 
Nothing goes in and nothing goes out. Nobody goes in, nobody goes out. What does this sound like to you? Starvation. And they're being killed, persecuted. It's, it's Gaza, essentially. And he knows that all of this is because these are the early Muslims who are accepting the message of Islam. And if they were to just not, if they were just to say, I'm not a Muslim, they would be fine. But because of the message of Islam, they are being killed. They are being starved. So imagine carrying all that. And after that entire amount of time, which the Prophet and the scholars say, and there's actually narrations from the companions, from the Sahaba, they were so worried about him because he was visibly distressed. And after, especially after the death of Sayyidah Khadija, he started to retreat. We're going to talk about loneliness. And he cut off going, to, going out. And he stopped going to as many things and events as he used to. And the companions started to say to one another, maybe we need to intervene. And one of the companions asked the Prophet وسلم, is this because of your grief over Khadija? And he said, yes. She was the mother of my children, the head of our household. She believed in me when everyone else called me a liar. She supported me with her money when everyone else withheld from me. Allah gave me children through her and didn't give me children through other women. This is, of course, before he marries um, and has, has his son Ibrahim, who passes away. So actually only the living children come from, say, the Khadija. And so think about this for a minute, how intensely grieved he was. So when we say Am and Huzn or the year of sadness, it was intense. And then what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give him? What happens next in the seerah? The Isra wal Ma'raj, the night journey and the ascension. And it's amazing and it's healing and it's, it's, it's affirming. It's kind of definitely giving you the sense of like clarity and a sense of who you are because all of the prophets pray behind you. SubhanAllah. What is the metaphor for us? That when you go through trauma, when you have something difficult happen to you, Maybe you have a am al huzn or maybe it's a shahr al huzn right? Or yom al huzn I mean, it could be like a day, a month, a week, whatever it is in your case. Allah's not going to just leave you. He's going to send you metaphorically your journey and a, we hope a spiritual ascension for you too. Ya Rab, if you could just see the benefit in tribulation, the silver lining and even the things that are very difficult. This is the work we do in Islamic psychology. It is clinical, real psychology, if you will. <laughs> but it absolutely brings in and integrates the Islamic concepts of healing and health that your typical psychology doesn't necessarily see or integrate. I'm gonna move on to Sayyidina Ya'qub and just briefly say, the Quran also describes other prophets such as Sayyidina Ya'qub, the father of Sayyidina Yusuf, with a very clear description. And here we have a man who's crying so intensely that it affects his eyesight. What's the verse? It's powerful. Allah could have chosen to describe Sayyidina Yaqub in any way. He could have said his eyes were blue and his hair was, I don't know, brown. I don't, I don't know, inshallah. But he didn't. What he described was the fact that he cried so intensely, as in to say, all of this male culture of I don't cry, garbage. And all of this concept of telling men, you know, man up or whatever, or even women, right? Or telling boys don't be like a girl that cries or whatever, all this nonsense is nonsensical. That we say in our cultures, that we say to each other that is harmful. And also to say, you can grieve differently than other people. And this is how he grieved as a prophet of God. Would you ever say Sayyidina Yaqub is not a good believer? <coughs> that he needed to have better iman, billah. That he needed to pray more. Or that he needed to do any of the things that we tell each other and our family members when they're crying and sad. Mm. <laughs> this is why I begin the conversation about mental health like this. Because we know these verses. We know these concepts in the seerah. We understand as Muslims, are like, oh yeah, yes, yes, I know these things. But sometimes we don't connect the dots and string it all together and say, oh. <laughs> a lot of the things that we find in our cultures are actually quite 
I'm going to use a pop psychology term, toxic. I don't like pop psychology. But if there's benefit in understanding some of these concepts, then use it properly. And that is a proper use of the term. And so when you understand the prophetic approach to wellness, you understand that it is balanced, like the sister here said, mashallah. And it is balanced because you see that the disciples of the Prophet, the students of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, the Sahaba, understood holistic well-being. They understood things like, your Lord has a right upon you, your self has a right upon you, your family has a right upon you, so give each their right. This is a beautiful concept in our deen. It's a concept of balance, and it's a concept of understanding that you can't just sort of do all for your family, give, 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 with not actually turning back and filling your cup. And you can't do all spiritual pray, 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 pray. <laughs> all charitable work, all community work, all volunteering work. How many people do we know who do amazing works of charity, of khayr, of volunteering, and their family's falling apart? Literally. The household's a mess. This is not prioritizing. This is not balance. Our teachers talk to us about barakah, blessing, is in knowing your priorities and knowing how to balance the priorities. And so the takeaway message from all of these discussions so far is to show us that the Prophet ﷺ understood the concept of a holistic way of healing, that this was not foreign to Islam, nor is this some new age thing. And I'm going to share with you kind of after we go through some of the discussions of how do we do this practically, of sharing you kind of a vision and a dream, inshallah, that is exactly this, holistic and healing. And it is part and parcel of Islam. So let me tell you a little bit more. You saw the hadith earlier, the hadith of Salman. But now let's look at this second narration that's very similar. Verily, your own self has rights over you. So fast and break your fast. Pray and sleep. So you understand that there is this self-care that is actually not selfish to take care of yourself. People hear this term of self-care and they think, I don't know, manicure, pedicure, I don't know, I think, mashallah, massages, which could be part of self-care, <laughs> but it's not the only thing in self-care. Or they hear the word self-care and they think I'm saying be selfish. No, what I'm saying is be balanced. The trademark of Islam is balance. It's ummatun wasata, right? It's a middle nation of balanced people that are balanced inside of their homes and outside of their homes. And so when you... Uh, take care of one another, there is a sense of making sure you are taking care of others to be selfless, right? And also make sure you're taking care of yourself at the same time. It's impossible to look after other people if we neglect our own well-being. You're going to want, okay, want something funny? One time I was on a panel of other speakers. <laughs> it's actually very uh, unfortunate. But anyway, I was on a panel with other speakers like this. We were all sitting, mashallah. And, you know, people send questions in on the virtual thing. <laughs> and I don't think they screened the question very well, <laughs> unfortunately. So somebody read out loud the question that came through. And halfway through the question was like, uh. <laughs> And the question said, um, all of you up here who are giving uh, Islamic uh, talks, um, you're talking about us being balanced people, but all of you are overweight. <laughs> yeah, haram. The moderator, you could see as soon as she said that, she's like, uh. <laughs> and I thought about it, subhanAllah, I thought, yeah. Whoever asked the question is absolutely right. Do you know what I mean? Do you know what I mean? Like, there's something about making sure that if you're somebody who's going to talk about balance, that you're actually trying to implement balance yourself. SubhanAllah. Well, no to the wise, mashallah. Anyhow, in the long run, if we're not very kind to ourselves and taking care of ourselves and actually making sure that we utilize that energy in the proper way, it actually is going to make it, it's going to backfire. Everything you do will have a sense of kind of backfiring. So here's my next question for you. How many of you have heard this statement? Come on, come on, don't be shy, don't be shy. <laughs> I 
I would say that's probably half the room, mashallah. That mental illness can be only cured spiritually. And the reason that this is problematic is because it absolutely reinforces a stigma of you can only do this through iman, you can only do this through dua, through salah. And that just isn't the case. All of these things must happen but also we must take care of ourselves in all the other ways that Allah has allowed for us to take care of ourselves, which modern medicine is part of that. People who are trained professionals to learn with a, le with a listening ear that knows how to help give you techniques and advice is part of that. Friends and family and support is part of that. When people say, I can do this all alone, alone, this is where the shaitan starts to come in and mess with them and say, you're strong enough. You can do this by yourself. You don't need them. But we do need them. And I'll give you an example of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I always start there. If the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was meant to deliver the message of Islam in a silo, then Allah would simply have just given him the message, given him the wahi, allowed for the revelation to come and for him to say, this, these are the words of the Qur'an. But he embedded the Prophet ﷺ in a community to have Sahaba, men and women, who were going to do things sometimes that weren't the best so that the Prophet could enjoin the good and forbid the evil and also do things that were excellent so that he could say, good job. <laughs> like the earlier story of Salman al and Abu Darda, where he said, Salman has spoken the truth. And a sense of community of people who are going to help each other and pick each other up and be there for one another. The first thing he does in Medina is what? Or one of the first things he does is what? Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is what? Akhuwa, exactly. He brings a person from, Quray, from, um, from Mecca and a person from Medina, right? From the Ansar and from the Muhajirin, and what does he do? Make them brothers, make them brothers, make them brothers, <laughs> inshallah. You are now brothers in faith, a sense of community. This is so important because now we're going to tackle the discussion of loneliness. And how does that tie into our Islamic worldview when the concept of ummah is so powerful? There is no other nation on earth that has the concept of ummah the way we do. In this room alone, I'm seeing multiple ethnicities. Yet I say Palestine, your, blood, your heart bleeds. You may have nothing ethnically, heritage-wise to do with Palestine, but as a Muslim, what do you feel? Okay. Intense pain. So what is this topic of loneliness? What is this cool thing? Let's see. <laughs> loneliness, it says, feels people has people feeling very empty, alone, unwanted. And they crave the human contact, but their state of mind creates barriers to building meaningful connections with other people. Most people that I talk to who complain about loneliness will say, I actually want to be in the companionship of other people. I actually crave this. But either I don't know how to go about it, or People don't seem to take well to me, or I'm very shy, or maybe perhaps it's a social anxiety, or I can't find connection. I live in a place in which I just cannot find people to connect to. And look, the numbers are actually terrible. The numbers I have are from the US because this is where I live. But if you look at it, you're talking about having uh, lone, being lonely increases the risk of premature death by 26%. And so, so, I, so social isolation increases it by 29%. And you have all of these physical symptoms that increase as well. Stroke, heart disease, dementia, and then mental health symptoms, anxiety, depression. And you're thinking to yourself, all of this from loneliness? Why? Why? Because there is a direct connection as, in as human beings. Again, this is the Islamic worldview or model of the human being. Imam Ghazali does a very excellent job of explaining the human being as an interconnected person. Mind, body, and soul are interconnected. And if any one of them is unaligned, right, it's kind of off in alignment, you're going to feel it. Everything else is going to feel it. You will end up with heart disease. You will end up with higher blood pressure. You will end up with actual mental health, emotional, and cognitive issues. 
even when spirituality is out of line, that too causes the same thing. And so when we look at this, all of these issues that we all try so hard <laughs> to protect ourselves from, drug abuse, depression, stress, decreased memory, and brain changes, all of these are parts and parcel of what can happen when loneliness is continuous and not addressed. And loneliness is more than just this perception of isolation because you can be amongst many people and still feel lonely. You can be in a room of people, this many people, and still feel very lonely. But it's more than that. It's more than actual physical solitude. So for example, imagine a busy professional in a crowded office, many colleagues, yet this person feels loneliness because they feel disconnected from their coworkers or from any meaningful social connections. Yet they're in a crowd of people. And so the pandemic only makes this worse. And we've done a couple of studies actually on the pandemic and Muslims. And it's very interesting to see. I have to tell you this story. <clears throat> There's a big research study. I was part of, a, I'm part of Yaqeen. And this is a, what the, some of the things they do is research studies on Muslims. And this particular uh, research study was my lab plus Yaqeen together doing a work on COVID-19. And it was a global study that had about 10,000 people in it, 10,000 Muslims in it. That's a, a massive study. And when, you, when we looked to see what people were saying about Muslims and COVID-19, it was amazing. And I was interviewed by a journalist about this research paper because she found it fascinating. She was trying to figure out what is everyone doing in the pandemic? And I said to her, look, like everyone else, we're feeling isolated. We're feeling the sense of uncertainty is very large. You know, people don't know what the pandemic, if you remember those early days, we didn't know what was going on with this thing. And uh, I said, however, for the Muslims, we have things that anchor us. And she said, like what? I said, like our salah. We have five daily prayers. It does not matter what's happening. They are fixed times that you're going to pray. <laughs> so whereas in the pandemic, when everyone was on lockdown, and day became night, and night became day, and everybody's days were all mixed up because they were home all day long on lockdown, Muslims were still able to know night from day because of their prayers, right? They weren't just binging on their, you know, movies and they weren't just sort of like in, you know, isolation. Even though physically we were in isolation, there were still things connecting us to the night and the day. Anyway, this lady, journalist, she writes this down. A year later, literally one year later, she emails me again and she says, uh, do you remember me? I'm like, <laughs> a year later, I'm like, I don't remember a year, Michelle. And she's like, we had a conversation about COVID and the study and how you were telling me how Muslims pray. I said, okay. And she said, um, you know, I've talked to people from every other faith. Her, her article that she was assigned to do, she talked to people from Christian faith, Jewish faith, Hindu, Buddhist, atheists, all kinds of people. And after she read this, after she finished the paper, she called, she emailed me back and she said, I'm really stuck on the Muslims. And I said, what, what happened? And she said, what you talked about with the prayers and the findings, well, what were the findings of the paper that we did? The findings were this. Muslims who had a better sense of increased tolerance to the unknown. They had the ability to tolerate uncertainty. Uncertainty is a function of anxiety. So those who can tolerate uncertainty had a much, much better mental health outcome. And those who did not know, weren't able to handle the uncertainty of the pandemic, guess what? We looked at things like major depressive disorder, MDD. Do you know that if they had lower rates of being able to tolerate the uncertainty, their depression rose by 70%, almost 69%. And the opposite was true. What is tolerating the uncertainty called in Arabic? What is it called? Tawakkul. Certainty is yaqeen. Being able to handle the uncertainty of things, right, is having what? Tawakkul on Allah. You understand that this is bigger than you and bigger than anybody and bigger than the whole, this little tiny little microscopic virus caused everything to shut down. Right? Oh, everything shut down. Yet here is Allah Azza wa Jal telling us that if I have sent an illness, I shall also send a cure. 
لكل داء دواء. Right? For every illness, there will be a treatment or a cure. Because some narrations say dawa and some say shifa. And so think about that. So I told her this in the, in, the, in the article. So a year later, after she talks to all these other groups, she comes back and she says, you know, I'm an atheist. And I said, okay. And she said, but after what you said, I think I need to pray. <laughs> I said, Allahu Akbar. Now repeat after me. Ashadu. <laughs> <laughs> Inshallah. She really, really, she was just so amazed by this thing that Muslims do called prayer that kind of kept their day kind of in line and gave them the ability to handle the uncertainty because they put it on Allah. They understood that you just give this to Allah because it's beyond your capacity. So what does that teach us? It teaches us that you can be in isolation, you can be lonely, you can be in lockdown and still feel connected because of the spiritual sustenance that Islam gives you. But it's not enough. There's more to the story. And the more to the story here is understanding that we're part of a community, an ummah, the believers in their mutual love and compassion and sympathy are like a single body. When one of its organs suffer, the whole body will respond with sleeplessness and fever. Is this not what's happening to you right now when you see what's happening in Palestine? Or anywhere else? The Sudan, things that are happening in the Congo, What's happening to our brothers and sisters in China? I mean, think about all of the things that you are hearing, all the places. Think about the natural disasters that happened recently, right, in Turkey and in uh, Morocco. Think about the earthquakes in Libya. Think about the floods. Think about all of the, think about the people in Syria. Think about all of the different parts of this ummah that are ailing and hurting. Don't you hurt too? And this is part of what I mean by the concept of loneliness and how the ummah and community heals. And when you're part of a community, you start to get better. And so part of this discussion is, and all of you are here, and we're going to have a couple slides at the very end of how to stay connected to one another, inshallah. Because I think it's powerful that you actually find a sense of community with one another. You're all here, inshallah. So we share this deep sense of empathy for Palestine because we're so interconnected and unified as one body that feels collective pain. And the question is, how do you cultivate the sense of healthy spiritual solitude within this interconnectedness? I'll tell you. Now we're going to go to another prophet in the Quran, Sayyidina Yunus, and the story of the whale. You know the story. I know the story. We've heard it since we were children. But let's look at it from a psychological lens, shall we? The prophet Yunus was so angry, <laughs> you might even say agitated, with his community, with his people, that he gets so upset and he finally just storms off. He's like, enough of you, <laughs> enough with you. And there are people in your family, your community, your friends, who you've had this same reaction. You're just like, enough, <laughs> done, right? And you walk off. But what happens when, as a prophet of God, he walks off from the people he's meant to give hidayah to? or give, deliver them the message to, Hidayah comes from Allah, but he's meant to deliver the message. What happens? What's the story of Sayyidina Yunus? What's the story? What happens? Come on, guys. <laughs> We're gonna need to have seed class too? Inshallah. <laughs> he gets swallowed by the whale. And now he's in complete darkness and despair. Have you ever seen a whale in real life? Have you? Have some of you actually seen a whale in real life? It, have you ever been in a boat next to a whale in the, in the open ocean? It's something out of this world. I can't even explain it to you. You have to just sort of try it <laughs> to understand what I mean. It's like out of this world, subhanAllah. And when you understand, because you see how incredibly, you can't imagine how big it is until you see it. And when you see how big it is, you go, oh yes, a human can fit in there. Okay. <laughs> but when the mouth of the whale closes, you're in complete darkness and it's slimy and gooey and yuck and oh my goodness. And so imagine. And here he is sitting in complete darkness, realizing, I goofed up, inshallah. <laughs> and so in that isolation, talk about serious isolation and loneliness, he turns to Allah Azza wa, Azza wa Jal and he says a very powerful dua that I actually think many of us should learn. And actually, in my own halakha, we actually use it as some of the athqar that we say of the halakha. We say this every, <laughs> there's some athqar that we say beginning of every halakha just to kind of get us oriented to the halakha before we start. This is one of them. 
لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إني كنت من الظالمين لا إله إلا أنت There is no God except you سبحانك Praise and glory be to you إني كنت من الظالمين That I, indeed I, am from the wrongdoers I want you to focus on this for a minute What does Sayyidina Yunus here do? He acknowledges that he messed up He starts by giving praise to the one who deserves all praise. And then he calls upon him for assistance. When you goof up, when you mess up, when things seem really dark and bleak and you feel like the whole world is tightening around you, and you feel like there's no way out of whatever situation you're in, you don't have to be in an actual whale, but you could feel like you're in a whale. Say this, the good. Shall we say it together? La ilaha illa anta subhanak. Inni kuntu min al -dhalimeen. It's beautiful. And of course, it's directly from the Quran. It's a Quranic dhikr. And it's a beautiful thing to say to yourself. And when you feel really tight like that, our teachers of spirituality say, say it multiple times. Why do people say dhikr multiple times, by the way? Why? What does that mean, affirmations? People ask this all the time, and I don't have a specific number for you. you. You say whatever amount is good for you, but why 50? Why 100? Why 1,000 even? Why? Why do people say dhikr so many, the same thing over and over and over and over? Why? It gives you yaqeen and comfort. It does change you, and it gives you yaqeen and comfort. Look, I'll tell you from a psychological perspective. This tongue says the dhikr. The next thing that happens is that these ears hear it. These ears hear it, this mind registers it. This mind registers it, this heart starts to feel it. And then it pours out and the limbs start to actually take action. Do you see what I'm saying? But that, for that process to happen, requires over and over and over and over until it finally solidifies. Do you know what I mean? Inshallah. We'll take questions, inshallah after. But I want you to think about that because sometimes people are like, I don't know what the point of saying dhikr over and over and over and over. <laughs> Mashallah, when you do dhikr, it's something in which, because actually it's one of the antidotes, I'm kind of ahead of myself a little, but one of the antidotes for loneliness is dhikr. And dhikr is typically done alone. You can do it in a group if you wish, but it's typically done alone as well. And when you do dhikr, you can't just kind of go on autopilot, right? Like a parrot, just parroting over and over and over without thinking about what you're doing. You actually have to be, have the full consciousness of what you're saying. And when you lose that consciousness, say another dhikr. Say the translation, read the translation, make sure that you are connected to what you're saying. And then the benefit will come, inshallah. So what happens with Sayyidina Yunus and the whale? It demonstrates that even those who are the closest to Allah, a prophet of God, after the prophet Muhammad وسلم, the best of all people are the other prophets, and the best of the cream of the cream of the cream of the crop, mashallah. And yet even the best of people have moments of isolation and seclusion and find within it strength, guidance, solace, because you can make it into something dark and despairing, or you can turn a difficult thing into growth. We call this a growing edge. You find a growing edge. You find the silver lining that helps you grow. Rumi, in his poetry, which of course in the West they love to think it's about your boyfriend and girlfriend and all the rest. <laughs> He's talking about love of Allah, and people think it's love of a human being. I saw this really funny meme that said, it had Rumi on it, and it said, um, I'm not talking about your boyfriend, I'm talking about Allah. <laughs> Anyhow, alhamdulillah. But he said, light enters from where there's an open wound. And it's a beautiful concept that if you really want to grow and get better and polished, sometimes it takes some really difficult things happening. And only the believer understands what I'm saying. Because everyone else is like, but they're in pain. Actually, we had this happen in the conference earlier today. Somebody was talking about Gaza and Palestine and said, inshallah, through this, they're going to be healed and purified. And inshallah, the, martyrdom, the, martyr, the martyrs will be accepted. And I mean, you know, all the rest of it. And someone said, but they're in pain. Of course they're in pain. But pain has meaning too.
And it does not mean that we don't advocate and do all the things we need to do to stop this. But you also have to have a, a believer understand that everything Allah sends us has a purpose and a meaning. Nothing is haphazard. And nothing happens coincidentally. So, now questions for you. What are your coping mechanisms for your mental health? I gave you some. What do you do? Exercise. In Exercise. I love that. In nature. Yes. One of my beautiful, beautiful teachers of spirituality, especially during the pandemic, she would say, you all need to go outside and touch a tree. <laughs> we were like, like, why do you want us to touch a tree? And she said, because you need to break out of this virtual bubble that you're constantly in. So many of us are behind screens almost every, almost all of our waking hours behind some form of screen, a phone, a computer, or something. And she said, break that virtual bubble, nature therapy, basically. You're going to get me started on the Madistans. <laughs> I'll say this quickly, because I'm going to come to it again later, this concept of the Dada Shifaz, or the Madistans, as they were called, the hospitals of the Muslims, one of the most amazing trademarks about them is that they were always, of course, ar architecturally beautiful, like any Islamic architecture, beautiful. Everything had symbolism, all the geometry had symbolism to it, spiritual healing. But also, they always had greenery and fountains and nature, and they were set in places in which when you enter this hospital, they call them healing centers, not hospitals, but when you enter into them, your soul starts to heal. Your mental illnesses start to heal and your physical uh, ailments also heal. This is the way of the Muslims. Very far from where we are in our hospitals today. But yes, nature therapy, thank you. What else do you all do? Journaling, Journaling. very nice. You're writing and talking to Allah at the same time. I love that. And you also said gratitude, having shukr and hamd. I love it. Yes, what else? Dua. Yes. I feel like he hears me and I connect with him. Especially when I feel like, like, um, I feel like the shura and the dua and I give up, I feel like, okay, I've, I've connected with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is really important to me. Powerful. And going to the beach. Excellent. That's, that's right. You're in Qatar. You have all kinds of water. Excellent. Mashallah. <laughs> Excellent. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> Sorry? Connecting with like minded hearts. Hearts. Mashallah. Very nice, very nice. Alhamdulillah, I love that. Alhamdulillah. What else? You're, you're driving? You just go take a drive. <laughs> I know people like this, inshallah. Good, good, clear the mind. And then someone said something very important just now. Yes, night prayers. You all have something very interesting in this building. You have khalwat. I've never seen a modern day building that has that. You've seen in the historical buildings. Huh? Do you guys know that you have a khalwat? This is for Atika for Ramadan. For Atika, yeah, Habibti, not just Ramadan. Okay, don't get me started. <laughs> I'm, I am very particular about this, mashallah. Yes, yes, mashallah, but it's a beautiful thing. Okay, we're going to have to talk about that. So let me tell you, these are all beautiful ideas. Please make note of them. Learn from one another, collaborative learning. What, what is a khalwat? I'll, I'll explain, I'll explain in just a moment. I'll explain <laughs> in a minute. Um, I just want to say this. Mental hygiene is often defined as a set of practices that allow you to enjoy your mental well-being in harmony with your surroundings. So if that means you're going to the beach because that is what your surrounding is or taking a drive because it's easy to drive around here, mashallah, in solitude and thinking, alhamdulillah, whatever it means for you. Now, I want you to think about your own coping mechanisms. You don't have to say them out loud. Just think about them for yourself. And think about it for me, whether what you do to cope is Positive or negative? Does it work or doesn't it work? Because some people will go binge, <laughs> either on food or TV or movies or whatever it is. And that's how they cope with whatever anger or difficulty is happening with them. Other people will talk with their friends on the phone, and they feel like they vented, right? They got it off their chest, right? But then in all of that talking, there could also be some potential harm. What else do people do? Think about it for yourself. And then look at this, inshallah, about with me. You have unhealthy coping mechanisms that help you feel good in that moment, but they may have long-term negative consequences. Like, for example, lots of junk food. And then there's healthy coping mechanisms that you may not feel immediately better, but there's long-term gratification from that. 
And when you think about loneliness, there is a difference between loneliness and solitude. Hmm. Difference between loneliness and solitude. Look, loneliness means that a person feels a sense of isolation despite this desire to connect with other people, and there may be an involuntary separation or rejection or even an abandonment by others. So there's a negative connotation here. But when you look at the word solitude, this is somebody who voluntarily takes some time away from other people and needs some space. Either you need space to heal or space to just regroup, or you just need to kind of like be away from people just to right, get a sense of yourself again. Because if you're constantly in the service of other people and you're constantly working for other people, constantly talking to other people, you have no time for your actual self. There's no balance. So I want you to think about this. The Prophet وسلم, one of the main things that he used to do was solitude. And he used to do this even before he became a Prophet Where would he go? Have any, has anybody ever climbed up there? Climbed up Jabal al-Nur? Have you hiked all the way, halfway? <laughs> Have you climbed all the way up? All the way up, all the way up? MashaAllah, it's amazing. And it's, uh, and it's not a very big space, right? Especially the place where he would pray. It's really just enough for one person. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But think about that. Think about how he would do this even before he became a prophet. And after, and first, let me, before I go there, why? Why? This wasn't even part of uh, the regular practice that people used to do at his time. What was he doing? What was he doing? He was doing this because the people of his community were different than him. They were idol worshippers. They thought differently. They did things differently. And his, he was always from the Ahnaf, from the people who always believed in one, one God. He didn't believe in all these idols and all the rest of it. So there was always this disconnect between him and the people around him. And it was almost like you live amongst them, but it's almost like too much and I need space. <laughs> and so he would go to his Ghar Hira. And, and it says in the Sira that in the weeks and months right before Nabu, especially in those last six months, right before revelation comes at the age of, I keep quizzing you guys. <laughs> Make sure you know the Sira at the age of 40. Yes. Right before it comes, it says that he increased the amount of time he would go and stay in Ghar It's almost like he could feel something, something heavy, 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 something heavy is coming. He didn't know what, but he could just feel it. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. After Islam came, what does this practice of solitude in Ghar become formalized as one of his sunnas, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? And what was it called? What do they call it? I'atikaf. I'atikaf, which means spiritual seclusion. And the Prophet ﷺ practiced this all year long. <laughs> people, people, okay, look, let me, let me do a, a little social experiment with you guys. When I say I'atikaf, what do you think of? Ramadan. Ramadan. What else? I need two more words. Still Ramadan. I need two more words. In the masjid. Okay, got it. Who? I keep hearing uh, uh, Ramadan. No, you're not supposed to sleep in your attica. <laughs> you have a little bit of sleeping, sure, if you're going to be there for many days in a row. Hello, Akbar. Yes? Yes, 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 exactly. MashaAllah, Barak Riki. Most people, when I say atikaf, they say men. Okay, so here's another experiment. From the woman in the room, how many of you have done atikaf? <gasps> and in the masjid? Yes. And at home? Do you guys remember what I said when I was here in the summer? Do you remember the homework assignment? Inshallah. <laughs> I gave you this homework assignment, I think. I can't oh. It was that when I come back next time, I thought it was going to be much later than this, but subhanAllah, here I am, that you would have practiced the concept of i'tikaf as a woman and outside of Ramadan. Inshallah. <laughs> In Ramadan and outside of it. Let me tell you why. Oops, hang on. Hang on, hang on. 
Oh, oh, well, actually, before I go to that, let me just say this one hadith. This is actually important. The whole idea of in community and in congregation, the importance of it is also recognized by this concept in Islam, in which a salah in congregation is 27 times more meritori uh, meritorious there we go, than salah performed individually. So when you pray in jama'ah, in congregation, which inshallah we're going to do after this talk, because people are wondering about Aisha, we decided we're going to do Aisha together after this talk, inshallah, is 27 more times more uh, thawab, more merits. And it alleviates your loneliness and encourages social interactions because you would hope that when you pray in jama'ah, at the very least you're going to turn around to this person next to you and say, assalamu alaikum, and assalamu alaikum, right? how are you? And there's going to be some sort of social interaction. I had a patient one time that I worked with and he had immense social anxiety. And I said to him, he avoided everything, everything, everything. Other than his family, he just, he just, it was too, too much for him. And I said, as a man, how does, what do you do for Jummah? And he says, I pray way outside, like way in the courtyard. Why? So I don't have to say salam to anybody or talk to anybody. And I said, okay. So part of what you do with someone with social anxiety is you work on what we call exposure therapy. And so I said, next Jummah, you're going to take two lines forward in the courtyard. The one after that, two more lines than the other, until you finally got to the edge of the, the masjid, you know, mashallah. And then finally, in the masjid. And then finally, further up, and then, and then finally, now say salam to the man next to you. It took weeks, weeks. But today, if you ask him, this is several years ago, if you ask him today, he says that he now, it's still hard for him, but he's still, but he's able now to go into the masjid, and he will say salam to the people next to him and go right on. <laughs> <laughs> bless him. But it's, it's powerful when you do this kind of therapy. And also, social anxiety is a real thing. And it is powerful because it is healing. And you don't feel a sense of isolation when you know that somebody in that congregation, that jama'ah, knows your name. How does it feel when one of your sisters come up to you and goes, Rania, it's so good to see you again. And you're like, oh, you remember my name, mashallah. It's just a beautiful feeling, right? Or you remember theirs. Or you remember something about them. SubhanAllah. And also, I want to tell you that this concept of connecting through prayer, through remembrance, through supplication, through studying the names of Allah, which actually is the topic of my halqa in this current time. SubhanAllah, we've been doing the 99 names of Allah, and I hear that's what your topic of your halqa is too, which is amazing, SubhanAllah, that Allah has said to us that he's created humankind to fully know what their souls whisper to them, and he's closer to us than our very jugular veins. So. Here is my solution to the story. And this is something that was created by one of my teachers. So I give credit to her. Her name is Ansa Sosan Aymadi, and she put this into three R's. That's how she taught it to us. And it was very helpful. She called it reflect, retreat, and remember him often. And that this is an antidote or a cure for people when they're feeling a sense of isolation not solitude, but isolation, loneliness. And what does this mean? Retreating means that you're actually able to take time away from everybody else. The word khalwa that I said earlier translates from Arabic into English as basically taking a side, taking away physically, taking yourself away into a retreat physically, a spiritual isolation. It is the same thing the Prophet ﷺ did in Ghar Hira. That was called a khalwa. Because it was in nature, it was not inside of the masjid. And for a man to do khalwa in the masjid, we call it i'tikaf. Now for a woman, she may do i'tikaf in the masjid, which you actually have i'tikaf rooms here, which is amazing, mashallah. Very rare, by the way, to find a masjid in which the women even have i'tikaf rooms. And then, if a woman does atikaf in her home, which is only available to women, men have to do atikaf in the masjid, just like Jumad has to be in the masjid. But for women, they have the flexibility of either home or masjid. And for the home, how do you do this? How do you do this? How do you do this? Just in your own room. In your house right now, in your apartment, your house, there's probably a place that you often go to for prayer. Right? Like you typically pray, usually, in a certain place. No? Yes? yes. <laughs> like, I don't know, inshallah. <laughs> Some people have an extra space in their house. It's like the salah corner where the family gathers for prayer. 
Some people don't. I personally don't have that kind of space in my house, but I have a little area in my room in which I typically go and pray. It's where my prayer rug is, where my Quran is, where my, where my things are, for my spiritual. So for me, as a woman, what I do is before I enter into that space, so here I am, I haven't entered yet, I make my intention. Because it's only two steps, it's very easy. The first step is intention, niya. In al amal bin to start with intention. And the intention, you can say it in any language. In Arabic, you say, نَوَيْتُ الْإِعْتِكَافِ وَهَذَا مَسْجِدِي I intend i'tikaf, or spiritual seclusion, and this place I'm about to enter into is my masjid. So for a woman, her home, or part of her home, a section of her room, or a room in her house, can be transformed into her masjid to do i'tikaf. Did you know this? I'm getting all kinds of things, <laughs> inshallah. But I find a lot of women don't actually know this ruling. I didn't know it either. And this is the beauty of studying Islam for yourself and not just relying on past me down religion. When she makes this niyyah, she enters into that space and now it's transformed into her masjid. People ask me this all the time. What about other people if they walk in and it doesn't bother them? For them, it's not masjid, it's just a room. But for you, the one who made the intention, it is your masjid. And then, now you can do i'tikaf for as short or as long as you want. And that's beautiful too. There's no time restriction. And there's no restriction on what you do exactly. Because you could do anything from prayer to dhikr to dua. You can read Quran. You can turn on your favorite YouTube, uh, Shaykha, Shaykha, listen to them. right? You can do anything that spiritually connects you. You can journal. You can talk to Allah through dua. You can do any of these things that help you. And if you need some water, or you need some snacks or something, يعني, a little bit of other than ibadah, a little bit of other things is permitted. Or a little bit of talk. Mama, where are my socks? <laughs> <laughs> They're in the drawer on the bottom. Okay, <laughs> didn't break your atika. The only thing that's going to break it is if it's excessive talking or excessive doing other things that is not ibadah. You can sleep, take a nap, especially if you're going to do a long i'tikaf, you'll need a nap, right? And the only thing now that's going to break it is when you exit. As soon as you leave, the i'tikaf breaks. No problem, you just make your intention again before you re-enter that room, or re-enter that section of the room, and now you're back in a state of i'tikaf. Why am I taking all this time to explain it? Personally, for me personally, this has been a game changer. It's been a game changer. Spiritually, in terms of spiritual growth, connectedness to my religion and to Allah, dedication to Quran, the ability to, in a very hectic, hectic, busy schedule, with family, with kids, with a husband, with people, with lot, with work and research and professor and college and a million things that I do, alhamdulillah, shukrillah, it's hectic. And this is my solace. This is my safe place. This is where I reconnect and I refuel. And it is so important that we do this, either in our masajid or in our homes, because in this modern day of absolute pace is so high and it's so hectic, you will burn out. And you will start to feel very lonely, actually, and disconnected from everything around you, even when there's plenty of people around you. Same teacher, Ansa Sosan, gave this beautiful example of Atikaf being like a pressure cooker. And I thought it was excellent. How many of you cook with pressure cookers? Yeah, a number of you. Anybody still cook with like an old time pressure cooker? <laughs> Mashallah. I recently, two weeks ago, I was in Cairo, and it's been a while since I had gone into my grandmother's old home, and uh, rahimahullah. And um, I walked in, I was like, oh, I always talk about this. And I walked into her kitchen, and I was trying to look and see, because the thing that always reminds me from my childhood is on the ceiling of her kitchen, there was always this, like, blast <laughs> from the old-time pressure cookers exploding, subhanAllah. And then it terrified her for the rest of her life. She never cooked with a pressure cooker again, even when they made the new ones. And so, subhanAllah, but I guess they had remodeled. I was like, where is it? <laughs> Mashallah. Anyhow, the, um, the idea of the pressure cooker is kind of like our daily life. Intense, 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 intense amounts of pressure that's literally going to cook you alive. And what is the thing that finally allows you to release the steam? Those of you who cook with pressure cookers, what do you do? 
there's a valve. That valve releases steam. If you forget to turn the valve on, which is what happened to her, she forgot the valve, it will explode. And this is exactly like us. And our teacher says, I'tikaf is the lever that allows the steam out from the pressure cooker. You need that space. You need the thing that allows you to blow off the steam, subhanAllah. And it's directly from the Sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, At the very least, it has to happen. It has to, it has to at least the very least. In the Sunnah, uh, following his Sunnah in Ramadan, in the last 10, yes, but know that the Prophet وسلم, did atikaf year round. He would do atikaf Thursday night into Friday. He would do atikaf between uh, Asr and Maghrib, between Maghrib and Isha sometimes. Sometimes he would do it after at Tahajjud time. Sometimes he would do it from Fajr after he prayed, waiting for the sun to rise for Duha. Different times of the day. He would also do atikaf in certain special days and special nights. I want you guys to take this on as a practice because it is a game changer, inshallah. What do you guys think? Is this possible? Yeah? And so when you come here to this masjid, right, and you want to use this atikaf room, mashallah, it's already in the masjid, so you're going to make your intention from outside of the masjid before you come in. And when you're home, you're going to make the intention before you enter into your space of prayer. Beautiful thing. Tell me next time, inshallah, when I come, how it was for you. And next time when I ask, I want like the whole room to raise their hands. <laughs> Inshallah. I want you to try this. I want you to try to practice it year round, to try to see how effective it is, and also to make this uh, part of your daily spiritual practice. You know when it really became a game changer for me is when I started to do this on a daily basis. You know why? I just said a woman can do this at home. And I said that there's no time limit to it. You can go as short or as long as whatever is available to you. Anybody connect the dots yet? Anybody connect the dots? Yes, yes. You can do at to gap with each one of your five prayer times as a woman. Every one of your five prayer times. Why not? If you're going to be home and you're going to go into the prayer area to, to pray onto your prayer rug, all you need is the prayer rug space. And you're going to spend five minutes, 10 minutes, whatever is allowed for you, and you have the time for, before someone goes, mama, <laughs> or become something else happens that needs your attention. Why not? Five minutes for this prayer, 15 minutes for that prayer, half an hour here, 10 minutes there, five minutes there, and suddenly what? In a day, you have a full hour of atikaf that you wouldn't otherwise have had. The amount of connectedness and the amount of letting steam off is powerful. It's one of the many things, but I want you to practice this one as much as you can. Just give it a go. See how it's like, inshallah. And because it's part of the Sunnah of the Prophet, it's powerful. The second R in this little acronym of the three R's is reflect. This is something you can do within your atikaf and outside of it. And it's something that we do a lot in Islamic psychology, is the concept of tadakkur, engaging in dhikr, any form of dhikr. SubhanAllah, alhamdulillah, la ilaha illallah akbar. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad. And the third R is to remember him often. And to remember him often, and by the way, back to reflect, back to this one, the journaling works here too. Anything that helps you reflect. The remember him often is to contemplate and to make it a habit to do so. And to take these times, and there's a whole um, process to this, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time. We'll have to come another time and do another lecture on this. We're actually writing a book, alhamdulillah. We just signed for a book, alhamdulillah, on the topic of an Islamic alternative to meditation. Not because I have an issue with meditation, but because I believe that from our Islam itself, there are indigenous Islamic practices that are more powerful than what you get from secular meditation, which has roots in Buddhism which is not our tradition. It works, it works, but it is not as powerful as what our tradition has. So inshallah, make dua for us that we get started on this book and have it for you in the near future, inshallah. Dedicating these moments of time to reflect upon the magnificence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is incredibly powerful. And when you think about what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa taught to um, uh, Ibn al-Abbas, he says to him, if you need help, seek it from Allah. And know if the whole world were to gather together to help you, they would not be able to except if Allah has written it. 
And if the whole world were to gather to hurt you, to harm you, they could not accept if Allah has written it. The pens have been lifted and the pages have dried. This is powerful because it helps you reflect on qadar and qada, fate, what Allah has written for you. And for some people, it's going to be having been born into, what is the difference between us and Palestinians? Well, what is the difference? Yani, or those who are there. It just happens to be that they happen to be in a land, in a country in which there's, it could have been you or me. Do you know what I mean? What happened to the people that have natural disasters, earthquakes, floods, and so on? It could have been me and you, subhanAllah. There's nothing that makes us any better than them. And so you think about this. You really think about that if Allah had brought it to them, it's been written. And if the whole world tries to prevent it, they can't. And if they all try to harm you in some way, they also can't. Unless Allah has written it. And when you reflect on this, suddenly you become fortified and strong. Nothing scares you anymore. Nothing scares you anymore. Because you realize if it was meant for you, it's coming for you. And if it wasn't meant for you, it's never going to reach you. SubhanAllah. This is what our teachers say, suddenly kind of shrinks our anxieties down, shrinks our fears down, and actually puts things back into their real size again. It is a powerful teaching. And so think about this. This is something you can do in tafakkur or tadakkur, for example. So as we close up here, I want you to think about how you integrate these three R's into your daily uh, activities of everyday work and ibadah, and how it can have a heightened sense of awareness and presence of Allah. When people say, I don't connect to my prayers, I just do my prayers to check off the box, but I'm not feeling connected to God. Taking moments of pause like this absolutely connect you. You will feel a difference, inshallah ta'ala. And know that in our Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the way he taught us is a way of explaining to us, you can reframe things that seem really difficult. How? Because he taught us that you can be someone who's suffering deeply, yet be deeply beloved to Allah Azza wa Jal. I don't think there's anyone on the planet right now that's more beloved than the Ghazawi and SubhanAllah. They've taught us incredible patience and gratitude even in the trials that we're seeing. It is incredible to see people under rubble being pulled out saying, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. It is incredible to see people coming out and not bitter and angry, but rather reciting Quran. How do you do that? How do you do that? You do that because you had a whole practice for years of reciting Quran and dhikr, of giving shukr and hamd, of being somebody who understands that affliction comes from Allah, and so does peace and assistance. So, as I close here, I promised you a couple of things. If you take your phones out, if you would like, inshallah, we started a new group, and it's actually for all of you. <laughs> Mashallah. One of the organizations that I'm part of is called the Rahma Foundation, and it's an organization, a nonprofit, that is for educating Muslim women and girls. And we've been, we've had it now for, I don't know, 15 years, 17 years, it's been a long time, alhamdulillah. <laughs> And one of the things that the Rahma Foundation does is a weekly halakha. Now, the halakha that I give, or if I'm traveling like I am right now, one of the other ustadas fills in for me, happens on California time, Friday nights. So that would be your Qatar time, Saturday morning, I think, inshallah. <laughs> and so you're welcome to tune in, because we offer it by Zoom. I'm in person at my masjid, but we offer it in, by Zoom. And throughout the year, we have women's conferences like in two weeks on February 18th, we have a Ramadan readiness conference, mashallah, where we're going through the, all kind of the ahkam of Ramadan, all the rules related to it, and the spiritual readiness for Ramadan, for example. And then all through the year, these, we kind of have a, and especially, especially, especially Ramadan, we have these wonderful virtual qiyams. <laughs> mashallah. What do I mean by a virtual qiyam? For you, it's probably going to be in your daytime, because for us, it'll be our nighttime. And what it means is we bring so many women scholars, ustadas, faqihat, literally, women who, have, who are faqihas, mashallah, shaykhat, women who are hafidat, muqriat, amazing, amazing women from across the world, actually. And they each give reminders, they read Quran, they do dhikr, they sing, nasheed, they do different things, mashallah. And it just keeps you in a state of ibadah all through the month of Ramadan. And then through the rest of the year, we do these amazing kind of women conferences where through that, I always tell different women, you're going to connect with 
and jive with different personalities. So many different personalities in this room, you need that many different personalities of Ustadas to actually connect to. Inshallah, somebody, if not many of them, will inspire you. Inspire you to commit to yourself, to, your, to the deen, and also to knowledge of the deen. So many women after this have like started to really take on Quran or like really think about how am I going to get better and closer to Allah, that I probably have less years to live than I already have lived. Like it just becomes much more real for them, subhanAllah. So I invite you to be a part of this, inshallah, if you wish. And what we'll do is it's a, it'll be not a forward list. It'll be just a, uh, we will only send things on it. And something where we'll send to you anything related to women and the deen, inshallah, any conferences, events, talks, uh, classes, etc. if you wish, inshallah. And a way for all of us to stay in touch. The other thing that I wanted to share with you are some resources because I talked about mental health today. I don't know these resources, guys. I was at Mujadala yesterday and it is beautiful. I hope, inshallah, you guys all get the chance to go. The new women's center that was opened. But then also there's some other um, things here that relate to mental health that I hope you can connect to if they're useful to you, inshallah. And I also want you to have this QR code. And this QR code is the other nonprofit that I'm part of called Madistan. And Madistan is the name of those Islamic hospitals, the healing centers. If you know Farsi or Urdu, you know Bimad is illness, Stan is location. They were called the Bimadistans, or in Arabic, Dar Shifa, right, the place of healing. And so this organization, you'll have here in the different, um, in this QR code, mental health education, suicide prevention and support, which is a very real and important thing and something I often talk about, but not today. Cultural sensitive therapy choices for you, things that are directories, including some international directories that could be useful to you. And also a comprehensive resource hub related to mental health. So hopefully this is another resource for you to scan and to uh, connect to, inshallah ta'ala. And I hope you'll connect with Madistan and become part of our mailing list. Why? Because for those of you who are more interested in mental health things, what we do once a month is we have either a learning circle or a healing circle that is open and free to everybody, men, women, everybody, to tune into and to learn about mental health from an Islamic perspective. So we hope that's useful to you, inshallah. Please join the mailing list. And lastly, I have another announcement for you. For those of you who are interested in Islamic psychology, in mental health, we have very special subhanAllah this year. Every year there's a Muslim mental health conference and it's happening in three weeks, March 1st and 2nd, inshallah ta'ala. And this year I'm actually hosting it at Stanford. So if you want to come to Stanford, ahlan wa sahlan, inshallah. And if you can't, then please join us by Zoom. If for those of you who are more interested in academic work on research and clinicians who are talking about mental health and Islamic psychology, this would be a very cool event to be part of. There's a QR code for that as well. Our um, theme this year is about tech yes and tech no, and our keynote speaker is actually the Minister of Mental Health of Palestine, mashallah. She's coming to join us from Palestine. And right after that, Madistan has their legacy, and we have these wonderful awards that we give, and this year we're actually giving, uh, you know, even though he's passed, subhanAllah, our professor, Dr. Malik Badri, something called the Belkhi Award, but there's many amazing speakers part of this gala too. So please sign up for both events if you can, inshallah, and join us, especially if you're interested in mental health and Islamic psychology. And with that, we're done, alhamdulillah. Barakallahu fikun. Wa sallallahu ala al-hadi Muhammad.